Good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me? Just to thank you for staying on to, to listen to me. And uh, I'm happy that uh, there is no real presentation at this time of the day. Because uh, you're not concentrating now. Even the coffee can't help you or the vaping can help you. But uh, we'll share some ideas. Um, just as an introduction, I'm a psychiatrist. I've been head of the Department of Psychiatry at this university for the past 15 years and five years at another university in South Africa. But uh, since 2000 and 1995 to 2005, I was the deputy and also the chair of the Central Drug Authority of South Africa. So we developed the National Drug Master Plan, the first one between 1995 and 2000 in South Africa. We are now as a nation in South Africa uh, at the third National Drug Master Plan, which really is a template for guiding us as a country in terms of what to do with the alcohol and drug abuse. And I'm mentioning this because the first two drug master plans didn't mention harm reduction. The, word, the phrase harm reduction was not there, but it is there now. Uh, in my other role, I'm the advisor to the Minister of Health on mental health and uh, substance abuse issues. We had to develop a separate mini master plan for health, and that mini master plan includes harm reduction for all substances. And for the first time, it will also look at uh, tobacco, harm reduction uh, related to tobacco. That's not yet published, but uh, the draft is finalized. Um, and I'm mentioning this also because historically, we tend to follow as the country the drift or ideas that come from the USA, suggestions from the FDA, and also a lot of suggestions from the UK. Our, we, we have been following very closely the changes in regulations, taxation for various substances by the USA. Uh, unfortunately, at this stage, as a country, we have not yet finalized uh, regulations for tobacco. Uh, these are, have been to the community, people understand what has to be done, but uh, our concern is uh, the past minister and the team, because he doesn't work alone, had basically lumped all cigarette products and electronic, uh, electronic cigarettes and alternative substances, I mean methods of delivering nicotine, as the same thing. You said if you inhale, if you deliver nicotine, it doesn't matter what route you use, we'll tax them as tobacco. And I know that uh, many companies are not happy with that because you're introducing something that's, according to research that's available, going to reduce harm. Why tax it in the same way as something like raw tobacco that has so many uh, carcinogens or toxins that are known to cause cancer? So, so that debate is still on. The fortunate thing is that on the 8th of this month, we had national elections, and last week, Saturday, our new president was inaugurated. And last night, when we were having dinner, he appointed his first cabinet. The Minister of Health is a medical doctor who was two years my junior, and the deputy is also another medical doctor who was two years my junior at medical school. So they are friendly people, but I don't know whether they'll accept electronic cigarettes. <laughs> so, but we have to, therefore, give them information, scientific information, that can persuade them to look at alternatives. We are not saying they must accept 100% truth in what scientists are saying, but are saying they must look at alternatives. To give an example, I mean, we've had a panel discussion now on uh, smoking cessation programs, but you don't have those in public services in South Africa. You do have them in the private sector, but limited. So you don't have an organized national program on uh, smoking cessation. So we are not even training people to train others to provide the service to people who want to quit smoking. So if you open up the boundaries, we'll be able to uh, help my country. Uh, I'd like to move these slides now. So there are some facts I think I want to share with you on South Africa. We are a population averaging about 60 million. If you look at people who have migrated from the north Zimbabwe, Somali, Kenya, and so on, we could be at about 65 million. 
32,000 South Africans are killed by tobacco-related diseases annually. More than 343,000 children and about 5 million adults use tobacco on each day. And that's very important. And 6.6% adults, percent of adults use smokeless tobacco. This is like snooze that people put under the tongue or they sniff it and so on. Harm reduction is selectively accepted in my country, uh, very much so because of uh, TB and HIV AIDS. Uh, there are good programs of harm reduction in relation to management of hypertension, diabetes, and other chronic illnesses. But we learned a lot from uh, the spread of HIV AIDS in Sub-Saharan Africa. It forced governments, for instance, to accept that the uh, introduction of antiretrovirals would help reduce mortality uh, associated with uh, infection by the HIV virus. So this was a great move driven by communities. It was not driven so much by the scientists. The scientists said there is therapy available, but it was community organizations, non-governmental organizations that drove this process. And my belief is that uh, in the area of tobacco harm reduction, it's not going to be the science that was discussed in the past two days. It is going to be communities, smokers themselves, who are going to push government to actually accept that uh, there are alternatives in life. So I knew in current, Dr. Masterplan, as I pointed out, deals with harm reduction. And you may want to Google this. If you look at uh, South Africa, social development, drug master plan, you'll be able to pick the nature of our drug master plan. And the current bill, as I pointed out, not yet gazetted, lumps tobacco and e-cigarettes together. And there's no differentiation in terms of uh, taxation. This is a critical issue. And I mention this point because when you present these theories that we've been discussing yesterday and today, government says, what is the pro profit motive? How, are, the, are these companies trying to get themselves out of business? Uh, these alternatives that are providing, will they keep them in business? How much money are they going to make? So you find this duality of loyalty where governments actually inhibit harm reduction because they're getting a lot of money from taxation of tobacco products. That goes into old age pensions and many other systems. So they want to get that money. So anything that disturbs the profit from uh, uh, tobacco taxation is problematic. So if they're going to reduce taxation on electronic cigarettes or alternative methods of delivering nicotine, they will lose money that they want to use for various government projects. But they're not saying that very loudly. Same applies to alcohol taxation. They know that alcohol contributes to so many other problems. It's highly addictive. Uh, our water are full because people have uh, alcohol-related disease, but they won't talk too much about it because the relevant ministries want to use that money for various projects. And of course, people enjoy smoking. People enjoy drinking alcohol. Why am I unable to move this? Um, one of the issues that, uh, and I'm speaking here really in two roles. I'm a psychiatrist and I teach students for the past 30 years, but I also serve in government, and as I pointed out, I have to advise the minister. So there's a time when you hear me speaking as though I'm government myself, and I want you to tell me how to approve a budget for what you're presenting. But then there's also the notion of saying to students, Nicotine, it's a very interesting subject. Uh, it's a substance inhaled in tobacco smoke via lungs, and of course it reaches the brain within 10 seconds. So you have positive calming effect of nicotine within minutes, and people remain calm for a short period of time, and they're able to go through the whole day or part of the day. It triggers a number of chemical reactions, temporary feeling of pleasure and calmness. These things were discussed yesterday. But I think what people miss is that this is very short-lived sensations of pleasure. There's a, any, any drop in nicotine levels can lead to withdrawal, agitation, and people become very edgy. One cigarette is never enough, and more and more will be used in indicating individuals. And people are not the same. There are people who will tell you, I smoke in the morning and in the evening only. But there are people who smoke throughout the day. So it seems as though 
there is a different response to nicotine. Some people who want to have a steady concentration throughout the day, but there are those who, have, who need picks when they're under stress and so on. Breaking the, this cycle, particularly among mentally ill patients, is challenging and it's as equally challenging as quitting. The, the session before the tea break was really about uh, helping people to quit. And you, you pick this dilemma. I mean, some people would come to the clinic because they've been using electronic cigarettes and now they want to stop using them, which is unusual. Most people want there to stop smoking generally. It's not about e-cigarettes or alternative methods of delivering nicotine. But there are those who feel, I've been using the substance at these new products, but uh, I'm not stopping. How can you help me really stop using e-cigarettes or stop smoking uh, tobacco? So these are some of the dilemmas. Now, there are concerns from the WHO about the number of people in the world who smoke. One in three adults are smokers. 1.1 billion smoke tobacco on each day. China being the largest producer and consumer of cigarettes. Now, China has realized that they do have a problem. And they are beginning to adopt a positive outlook towards uh, the alternative methods of uh, delivering nicotine. And, and I'm talking about nicotine vis-a-vis -vis tobacco with uh, the number of toxins that are found in it. They've acknowledged that, uh, it's acknowledged that tobacco kills half of its consumers within a lifetime. The addictive culprit of tobacco is nicotine. Now here's the question that the minister would ask you. If you say emphatically or categorically that nicotine does not ca cause cancer, then they'll ask you, you say there are more than 7,000 toxins in cigarettes. Don't you think that the interaction with one or many of those uh, toxins can actually contribute to cancer. Have you ever tried just delivering nicotine without interaction with substances? I'm talking now about a minister of health who may not have gone far at school, he's just a politician, but at least we do have ministers of health in South Africa now who are medical doctors, but they'll ask the same questions. Have you proven that nicotine is absolutely free uh, of problems? Nicotine addiction is common in general population and 10 times more in mentally ill patients. Most psychologists do the assessments for us, and uh, it's proven very clearly that many patients who want to smoke. So nicotine reaches the brain cells in a very short space of time, and thus diver, uh, delivers uh, desired effects, calmness within minutes. And, and that's really the critical issue. We do know, sorry, why am I moving forward and backwards? We do know that uh, when you use these uh, vaping instruments in particular, uh, one of the key things that come up, there's a surge not only of, a, of, of dopamine, but there's also an adrenaline surge, something that you'll find. But you, you notice when you get out of flights, when you reach the airports, there'll be people who rush, get their bags, and then go and stand outside and smoke. Uh, because they're in a panic mode, and they want to deal with that. It can also inhibit the release of insulin from the pancreas. We heard yesterday someone who said, uh, maybe not, but uh, this slight inhibition of insulin can lead to hyperglycemia. And this is where you get the appetite suppressant effect from. I think it's critical to know that this is not a long-term thing. There are many people who try to use smoking generally to suppress appetite because they think uh, it does work up to a certain extent, but uh, you've got to be doing other things to lose weight. Dopamine increase with smoking is also another issue, responsible for feelings of pleasure and well-being. This means regular smoking throughout the day is necessary for some people to maintain this feeling of goodness. Uh, nicotine activates the same pathways in the brain that drugs such as cocaine and amphetamines do, although to a less extent. Now, ministers of health or regulators will say, well, if it acts like cocaine and amphetamine, demonstrate to us. Now, Constantino has uh, published a lot of stuff that shows that the effect of, of, of uh, nicotine on those receptors is minimal. But, and you can also work it backwards. The withdrawal from cocaine use or amphetamines is a very painful, very painful uh, withdrawal 
the relapse is, but you don't have the same degree of pain with nicotine. That, that's not on a general principle, and if you're talking to a layperson like a politician. And I think these facts must be packaged very well to demonstrate that you are dealing with something that is different. There are various chemicals that you find in cigarettes as a whole. Tar is critical. For instance, the smokers' lungs that you know of. And it's very clear from the data we have in South Africa and worldwide that uh, many lung cancers or people who die from lung cancer, cancer, different types of cancer of the lung, are heavy smokers, or have been heavy smokers in their lives. And of course, sometimes we add alcohol. Uh, more than 7,000 toxic chemicals in smoke. Carbon monoxide, this has been demonstrated by studies presented yesterday, that it increases the chance of cardiovascular disease. Uh, we had a presentation today that refers to nicotine and, you know, um, stiffening of uh, the arteries. Secondhand smoking has been the cause of concern for most governments, and that causes lung cancer in both smoking and non-smoking adults, and increases the risk of respiratory illness in children and sudden death in infants. So many governments that have uh, promulgated uh, regulations around smoking want to protect children, they want to protect other people who do not smoke because of secondary uh, development of uh, lung diseases. And this is a key issue for a government. Would you approve a budget that deals with uh, to tobacco harm reduction if it does not address the basics, protection of pregnant women, of children, and non-smokers? Is quitting easy? The panel before the tea break clearly demonstrated to us that quitting is not easy. Uh, these smoking cessation programs cannot happen just overnight, two months, a month. You mentioned one year. That's even a minimum because addiction is chronic and relapsing. And that applies to all forms of addiction, including uh, addiction to smoking or even nicotine. So we have to accept, and this is the point we have to give to government, that you are dealing with something like opening a tap that you cannot close very quickly. I think it's very, very important to, to say to government, investing in harm reduction is really investing in the future. You don't get immediate results, but long term, you reduce mortality, you reduce admissions, mobility, that leads people to being admitted into hospitals. So the general observation in psychiatry are the following. Increased use by people with social phobia and people with general anxiety disorder. Now these are the people who will not be admitted to hospital, but these are people you see in the workplace, they fight with you for no reason, they're agitated, they're short-tempered and so on. And also people with a mild, moderate depression tend to use uh, smoking cigarettes, but at the end of the day you know that they're looking for a nicotine fix. It's highly observed in patients with schizophrenia and sometimes together with alcohol. This is interesting because it seems like different mental disorders have a choice of substance of abuse. Schizophrenic patients tend to use more cigarettes than any other patient. Patients with bipolar mood disorder have a predilection for alcohol, but they also add smoking. So you may have a double jeopardy there where a patient is using both alcohol and smoking. You don't know which makes things worse. Generally high in psychiatric facilities where patients are idle, most of the time because of lack of recreational facilities. This is critical. In any psychiatry department, you must have OT, occupational therapy. You must have recreational facilities for patients. If patients are idle, they begin to hear more voices. They begin to get agitated and restless. And that's when they want to smoke, and they smoke a lot. And so in some hospitals, we found that the nurses would give the patients cigarettes to make them feel better. And, and they notice that they do get calm. Here's a problem. If nicotine and the various substances act at the same receptors where that trigger surges of dopamine and adrenaline, is there a possibility that nicotine itself or the other substances containing cigarettes can worsen the underlying psychiatric disorder? These things have to be proven. But even with that lack of absolute proof, it's very clear from studies that have been conducted that patients who smoke ordinary tobacco tend to do worse than patients who don't. 
And, and therefore, if you're providing alternatives of delivering nicotine in a different way, you should actually be making life better for those patients. What is critical here is that most of the World uh, Psychiatric Association, American Psychiatric Association, the World Psychiatric Association, and many others, are now saying, let us treat mentally ill patients like people in the ordinary population. They will have diabetes, they'll have hypertension, they'll have uh, lung disease, and so on. So whatever you do in terms of screening for any other person in society, you also have to do it for patients with mental illness. Because if you don't do it, drug-drug interaction is a serious problem. Our psychiatric medication, for instance, uh, for schizophrenia, and to some extent, bipolar with psychotic features, use of antipsychotic medication can lead to metabolic syndrome. But you have talked about the uh, suppression of um, insulin by nicotine. That can multiply the incidence of uh, metabolic syndrome. So those patients can complicate. So we have to balance issues. Which patients will you give electronic cigarettes to? Which ones should you not give? And there should be ways of assessing that. So nurses have observed that some patients do get better, but not all patients get better in smoking. Some do get worse. And the question is, maybe Constantino will tell us which patients get worse, because these are basically general observations. I think that uh, we have another difficulty with mentally ill patients. First of all, doing clinical trials. I've done many clinical trials. One of the biggest problems is getting consent from a mentally ill patient. In some countries, it's not legally acceptable. Either a lawyer or a family or the superintendent of the institution must co-sign the consent. And you've got to prove that this patient can fully participate in the study. So doing studies on tobacco, and specifically nicotine-related research on mentally ill patients is not easy. And so some of the interventions, for instance, in the UK and the US where some patients are, do, are getting uh, electronic cigarettes are really based on certain common, common agreements, but it's not easy to have uh, these studies approved by research and ethics committee. Where approved, stringent reporting requirements are imposed. Family must approve, lawyers may have to be involved, but there is an issue of relapse unrelated to cigarette use. Now, how do you determine whether this relapse for this particular patient is related to the fluctuations in the medication that he's using or interaction with nicotine or other elements in tobacco. This is something that has to be teased out. And of course, the truth is coming out that uh, even with that observation, patients who have been smoking a lot and we switch, who switch to electronic cigarettes tend to do better than those who be using uh, ordinary tobacco. There is a concern that mentally ill patients have physical illnesses similar to those of other general patients and should be treated equally. I think what therefore has to happen is for us to find ways of packaging information to government, but we have to answer certain questions. Is delivery, the new delivery systems for nicotine are going to help people quit? In the general population, how many patients or people have you seen who quit successfully because they used their e-cigarettes? Uh, that information is very conflicting. For, for instance, the panel we had before the tea break this was not coming out clearly. How many people quit successfully, aided by e-cigarettes? Um, is it really true that using this instrument will lead to quitting? If, if this is the case, you know, I think at the end of it, if you just project 10, 15, 20 years ahead, the tobacco companies would not be making money. Now, I don't know of any company that wants to get itself out of business. So there has to be a balance here and a realistic one to say, we have a problem that we have recognized that cigarettes do harm human beings in a particular way. But uh, how do we package this such that we balance the harm and, of course, uh, the, nest, the, the usual desire by people to, to smoke? We have to demonstrate that uh, in this select population, use of e-cigarettes will not worsen the condition. We need to demonstrate safety from general population data now, there's a lot of this data now, but the governments are saying this is too early. Uh, there was 
Soot earlier on quoted information from the Royal College of Psychiatry and other uh, authorities. But, but everyone is saying, you know, count the number of decades that uh, e-cigarettes have been in fashion. Uh, how many studies have been done? Are we happy with those studies? The questioning, for instance, of uh, heat not burn elements, they're beginning to say, you're worried about just clean delivery of nicotine. But when you heat something, other things come out. Reference to small amounts of copper and other elements that may be released. And yet, more and more research has proven that uh, whatever else is released when you hit, not Ben, you are not going to dramatically affect the patient's life. It's still better than smoking ordinary tobacco. You need also to have effective smoking cessation programs in place. I think this is key. Despite my comments on smoking cessation panel, I think that uh, those programs are very important because you cannot just provide e-cigarettes in a given place without a clear program on smoking cessation. I think the combination is essential because if you don't do that, um, you are saying to government, we, you want us to pay for people's misbehavior. You remember yesterday I posed a question, there was a question here about whether harm reduction is an issue of morality or it's an issue of science. And I said, but it's also an issue of politics because the politicians will decide whether they can support these programs. But they support them if you have a backup plan. And I think the smoking cessation approaches are a backup plan to introduction of uh, different electronic devices or alternative methods of uh, delivering nicotine. We have to also inform government about use of NRT, various medications, in reduction or reducing the craving for cigarettes. We have to have clear explanation of how vaping devices work and advantages over ordinary cigarettes. If you don't do that, most governments will simply say no. Now, having said all this, I've been to various malls in South Africa. You enter a mall, you find a stall there. People are selling vaping instruments. They're not allowed, but they get them in. They're selling them, despite government saying they are not legal. So, but they are there, people use them. So we have to assist government because I was talking to Shamila yesterday, I say, who assesses the type of oil that is being sold, the type of instruments, where do they come from, from China, from wherever, but are they, have they been tested? Now if they come in illegally, that's where the problem is. And that is going to be the downfall of uh, these alternative methods of delivering nicotine. If they're not regulated, you'll find everybody bringing stuff just to make money. And those can cause more problems than those that are properly tested. And this is key. I hope that uh, I'm conveying an important concept here because government will not simply accept our ordinary statements. Patients with schizophrenia need to, uh, need to smoke to feel better. That's another statement which is problematic. There are patients with schizophrenia who don't smoke at all. Not every patient with schizophrenia smokes. So the desire for the nicotine fix, it's not in every patient. But you have to demonstrate that there's a high percentage of uh, schizophrenic patients who smoke, particularly where there are no recreational facilities. Another problematic statement might be e-cigarettes will help patients quit. I've already discussed this. Not every patient will quit smoking or every person will quit smoking because of use of e-cigarettes. There are psychosocial interventions that must accompany use of these instruments, and that is very, very important. E-cigarettes can alleviate depression, anxiety, and other mild mental health discomforts. I think we have to demonstrate that e-cigarettes on their own are not a panacea. They are not a cure, but they do help people to get better, and people sometimes just enjoy smoking not because they're treating depression or anxiety, but people enjoy smoking like uh, some of us enjoy taking a glass of wine, but we're not necessarily alcoholics, you know, but there's not urge for you to, to drink, but you enjoy having a glass of wine with meals and so on. That statement has to be softened down to say that uh, some people could benefit. And uh, this has been demonstrated by the presentation uh, from Carl yesterday, that yes, there are negative effects of nicotine on the brain and on the body, 
but there are also positives, like the coming effect that was demonstrated by Jack yesterday. Patients smoke to mask symptoms. This may be true, but what if they stop smoking? Will the symptoms get worse? Not necessarily. So we have to develop measures to assess which patients actually use cigarettes or alcohol to dampen or mask the symptoms. But is that really true? Or is it just a compulsion to smoke or to drink because of whatever is going on in the brain? Should they continue smoking? You cannot force people to continue smoking, but uh, if they don't want to stop, why not provide them with alternatives that are safer? And this is the argument we have to put to government, and that is, has to be supported by clear studies. Nicotine can improve attention and concentration, yes. People who use cigarettes because of the effect of nicotine that they want do report that concentration has improved for that short period, they're able to do some work and so, so on. But uh, this should not be equated to a free pass to smoking. So you cannot therefore say to adolescents, if you want to pass at school or if you want to do better, you must smoke. That, it doesn't work that way. Now, I'm mentioning these things just from the perspective of government because these are the questions we get asked. What effect does this have on the person's ability to function on a day-to-day -day basis, to do office work and so on? Uh, should we be creating areas where people can go and smoke if they want to? And if they do smoke, should we allow them to use these vaping instruments, electronic cigarettes, and so on? There's a, there's a divided opinion on that. For instance, if you walk through most of the airports in the world, you're not even allowed to use uh, vaping instruments, not on the planes, no, no airline allows you to vape, and so on. But you remember, 15, 20, 30 years ago, you could smoke in some of the airlines. And that has changed because of uh, secondary smoking, which was found to be harmful to other people who don't smoke. So this is an evolutionary process. And in that evolution, we therefore have to accept that we have to do more and more research to help government understand that uh, we are dealing with something that's not easy because part of it is a physiological reaction. Secondly, it's just general socialization. You get socialized in a particular society where there's drinking and there's smoking, and you get used to it. But you're not thinking about the effects on the body. Food can harm us. Drinking too much water can harm you too. Running every day can be also harmful, and it is supposed to be improving your health. But you have to do it in moderation, and you have to know where to stop. Another statement says nicotine, uh, the patient has a right to choose. But this is, is this easy with mental ill patients? Are they making conscious choices or are they driven by some impulses? This is a very difficult issue because we do have patients who refuse to take medication, for instance. Can we force them to take medication? Well, we are told that if they are violent, destructive, and so on, we may have to report that and then force them to take medication. But um, in that psychotic state, when they're out of touch with reality, you, are, you cannot say they made a clear decision that uh, they want to smoke because it makes them feel better. Is that like a compulsive behavior or not? I think from psychology, you will help us learn because you've done these assessments most probably. People don't, mentally ill patients don't automatically choose. But if they're idle, they will use anything that makes them feel a little better and of course stop the agitation. So in terms of um, the way forward, in South Africa, this is work in progress. Most likely, it will be driven by the tobacco industry, clinicians, and the communities. Now, there is an aversion to work with tobacco companies. But if you take a general psychiatry, the best research was supported and driven by the pharmaceutical industries. And I'm not so sure why governments find it difficult to accept support from tobacco companies. If you're selling a product and you're told it could be harmful, why don't you use some of the proceeds to prove that it could also be handled differently? Uh, we have to try and deal with that concept. Most governments look at you, you know, with question marks if you, you are receiving money directly from tobacco companies. And yet I can tell you, 
The best research in psychiatry for schizophrenia, for bipolar mood disorder, was driven by the pharmaceutical industry, except that, for instance, in the US, there were perverse incentives. A lot of people took money, and they didn't declare from pharmaceutical companies. So there must be moderation. People declare, and the research is published, and is shared with government. We need to present alternative methods as adjunct treatment for deserving patients and not as panacea, because not all patients with schizophrenia, or bipolar, or anxiety, or depression will benefit from smoking. Some will, or many will, but not all. We have to have a variety of methods to assist patients and not just vaping instruments. So the smoking cessation, uh, cessation uh, programs uh, to help patients quit are very important. We've got to gather more data from countries that have already had trials. We have very little research in this area in South Africa, so I'm happy to have been here and to attend other meetings where I learn more about the possibilities in terms of delivering nicotine in a safer way. We have to find cost-effective methods of availing e-cigarettes to mentally ill patients. Um, in some of the hospitals in the UK where they're making these e-cigarettes available, it is a cheaper cost, affordable by the particular you know, district. Uh, but most governments would not want to pay for this. So there must be a way of dealing with the, the, the approach to, to delivering these things. Because government thinks these instruments are, are very expensive. We have to detail the cost factor, yes. Uh, and I'd really like to thank you for listening to me. And I want to learn from your questions. The chair, you should have stopped me 10 minutes ago. <laughs> you are very nice to me, but thank you very much for your attention.